Hi, you're listening to the Diablo Podcast. We are online at DiabloPodcast.com, and this is a service of DiabloInkGamers.com. I am joining the show today by Azure. Hello, hello. And by Grug. Happy to be here, Flux. The beta test ended, what, a week ago, I guess now, and we're going to talk about some beta retrospectives, some of our high points and low points, and we're going to talk about Grug's magical and mysterious encounter with Bashy at PAX East. What, did, he, did he glow like an angel fallen from the heavens? Um, it was more like the uh, coloration of, you know, the rares in the beta right now. It just had this golden radiance to him. Did you touch him? Uh, yes, he has thorns, Zara, though. <laughs> Did he have bad facial hair? He had good facial hair. So when you think back on the beta experience, any highlights or lowlights that jump into your thoughts? How about, we'll do a highlight first. Uh, how about you, Grug? Any, what's, what's your biggest, fondest memory of the beta in retrospect? Um, I know I don't sh- stop shutting up. But I never shut up about this. Uh, the article I wrote for Ink Gamers about Groundskeeper McCree, but it was seriously um, just kind of exciting, you know, going through the beta and finding some content I have never seen. I had never seen before. You know, he could uh, summon corruption wells. He had a little uh, shockwave attack. He would zap you if you hit him. He was really cool to find, and it kind of made me excited to think about what other kind of hidden things and random events will be in the final game. If you recall Diablo 2, they had all those secret rooms in the Act 1 in the, in the jail section. Yeah. And there were never any more secret rooms in the whole game. And that was because they had, had Act 1 finished for so long, they, they kept working on it and working on it, and finally started adding in more little bonus features and stuff just to spice it up. Mm. And then didn't, they didn't spend that long on any, of the, any, ah, on any of the other acts in the game. <laughs> Act 4. Yeah. So... I'm kind of hoping that we don't get the same thing in Diablo 3, where they have these millions of little cool Easter eggs in Act 1 and all these unusual monsters. Mm. And then you get to Act 3, and it's just like one big endless jungle that's all the goddamn same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's a concern, especially because the, the beta was also in Act 1 for Diablo 3. And it, uh, it looks like you know they probably tried really, really hard to, to polish that because that's what the public was seeing. So that's always been a concern of mine, but yeah. So do you have a highlight, Azure? Yeah, uh, actually, the first highlight is when the game, you know, when, when the beta, first, when I first got beta access, uh, the first playthrough was, uh, it, was a, it was a big relief because it was the first time I played it and it was actually very good. And so that was a, a very big relief uh, that the game was living up to, uh, to, to my expectations. Uh, you remember when the gate, uh, there was the bug for, for getting into the gate? Um, yeah, beyond the cemetery. Yeah, thing. yeah. Mm. That was also, I would say that's probably the next big highlight I had because it was the first time that we were able to see a lot of the uh, the content, which I guess I like to think of it as it sort of moves out of the t- tutorial and into the, the real game because the first thing you notice is there's a pretty steep difficulty. I mean, Flux, you played, we played around with it with me, and you probably noticed that the difficulty, uh, when you chose, say, a level 8 character, which is roughly the, the level you would be when you'd first access this, it actually turned, um, it, it was a pretty big stepping stone in terms of difficulty. The monsters were quite dangerous, there was a few more monster affixes, and, and in particular, there was a lot of random events. And that was really exciting to see that they actually are putting a, p- a huge amount of random events in the game. And if anything, there was I think there were more random events in one of those new zones than there was in the entire beta. The thing I noticed most clearly, I did it with a wizard the first time, and I think I was a level 11 or so. And I'd been just, you know, once you're past like level 10 in the beta with a wizard, you just sort of, are, do I kill him all with one shot or a different one shot? <laughs> do I just you play know, around with him for a while? <laughs> yeah, and I got into that area, and I had, I forget what my skills were exactly. I had arc, Arcane Shower, Arcane Torrent. I always think of it as Arcane Shower because, you know, it showers. But I had Arcane Torrent and, you know, you know Arcane Orb and like, you know, two or three other big spenders. And I was never having any problems running out of resource in the normal content because everything was dead before that that occurred. And I got into this bonus area, which admittedly I was I was in a three player game when I first did it. And suddenly I was constantly out of arcane power. I mean just instantly. And the monsters are half dead and I'm just I'm throwing I'm shooting my wand at them, you know? Mm. And it's like, okay, this is why they have all these signature skills that don't cost any mana. This is what you really need your magic missile and your charged bolt and stuff for. Mm. Because you're not able to just blast them and two seconds with your big killer spells. You've got to mix in the lower stuff as well. And that was nice to see. Just, you know, you get used to the beta being such a, a slaughter once you're geared up. So how about a low light from you, Grug? I guess that point, which I don't know exactly when it happened, where I'm like, okay, I beat the beta five times. Now what? Six. 
seven, eight, seven, nine. Eight, nine. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to go for high scores. I'm not that kind of player. You know. Yeah. I was amazed that some people would just you know, people like I've got I've gotten a million gold in the base yeah, so far. Yeah. I was like what? Baffled. <laughs> Are you in prison? <laughs> it's just I can kind of see that in the final game, because at least then it's like, okay, I'm, I'm building value of some kind. Mm-hmm. But it's a beta. It's going to get wiped in a week. <coughs> I, I just, I, do you have a low light, Azure? Again, it was a bit of sweet patch, because they added a lot of cool stuff, uh, like runes. But they also added the elective mode and skill UI uh, changes. Now, yeah. again, I think, you know, looking back from now... It's not that bad, and it's, it does work, and it does serve a purpose, but I still don't like the, the changes to the UI and the fact that elective mode in itself uh, has to be enabled through the options menu. I think it's counterproductive, and I think it sends yeah. the wrong message to, to new players because, you know, I had a friend, and this is sort of a real-life story, one of my friends during the Open Beta Weekend who played, you know, this guy was a very hardcore gamer he played you know wow a lot he was you know in one of the top guilds so the guys you know he's not he's not a noob or he's not casual or anything like that and even you know he was going and he was playing around with his spells after he you know played the game a little bit and he was basically he basically said oh look uh, i want to you know i wish i could pick um you know two of these spells like at the same time it sucks that i have to pick this other spell and he didn't know about elective mode and obviously he could have done that the entire time now had i not told him that there's pretty much no way he could have known that for starters. Even if he went through the option, what the hell does elective mode mean? I mean, elective mode could mean anything. It's not even, you know, it's not, there's no context to that setting. It's not like it's in the skill UI. It's just in the option somewhere. So he would have gone on, you know, playing, probably finished normal, you know, in the real game, without even knowing that he could have indeed had these two skills that he desperately wanted to use simultaneously. I think the skills were, I think the Monk Hill, um, Breath of Heaven and... and um, the blind skill, I think it was, because they're in the same category, which obviously without elective mode, you cannot choose those simultaneously. And it, it makes it look like the Mr. Pandaria system, which is very similar to that, where you basically have a choice between three skills. You choose one and off you go, and that's your talent, that's your customization. And that's a pretty bad message to send because Diablo 3 skill system is much, much more diverse and much more powerful than that. Bizarre design decision on the part of Blizzard and one of the community managers recently posted on the forums defending their choice to do so, something about um, how they like it better as tribal knowledge with players telling players how to do it. Occasionally you get one of these community managers where they're so, it's so transparent that they're making an <laughs> argument entirely to defend whatever the current system yeah, is. Yeah. I know exactly <laughs> you know, what like you're talking about. And, like, like, you know, the whole... It's like they always say, oh, rune words were terrible in Diablo 2 because you had to go to a website to find out the information and, like, you know, it, you shouldn't have to leave the game to get additional knowledge yeah. about it. And, and then, then when, when the tooltips tool got, <laughs> got simplified, oh, it's good. You can go to a website and look at the information. It'll give you a chance to learn more about the game. It's like, wait, what? The contradictions are, have been insane throughout the months. You're aware that we have a cerebral cortex that processes past events, and we call it memory, right? And we can, like, refer back to these things for <laughs> oh, reference. Absolutely. Oh, I got the exact quote here. Well, I wouldn't one say it, it's hidden, and we have a loading screen tip that calls it out. <laughs> we honestly didn't want to continue adding things to the skill UI, and as more advanced op- as a more advanced option, it felt right for it to be found or learned about through tribal knowledge, as it were. <laughs> Isn't that a witch doctor passive, actually? <laughs> <laughs> we intend for the game to be played at first with the current setup, and if someone wants to try a more advanced option, they can turn on elective. Look, that would be all good and well, except that the difference between non-elective and elective is absolutely game-changing. Yeah. I like how he says that, oh, it's in, the, it's in one of the loading screen tooltips. Problem solved. <laughs> Which CM was that? Quote from? Um, who do you think? <laughs> is it Bashiok or not Bashiok? It's, it's Bashiok, fine. <laughs> you just wanted him to say it. <laughs> well, he's... As they have a job to do, and their job is to defend the current system in the game. Yeah, that's, that's the real tragedy of it. Um, since they are the face of Blizzard, they're the ones that uh, contract the most ire from the players, even though that they, um, it's really their bosses that are telling them what to say, and it's their job to defend it, no matter how uh, bizarre or idiotic a choice it is. I mean, or ba- sometimes contradictory. Yeah. Yeah. Bashiok in particular, I think he, when he uses that technique, he actually purposely says it's his opinion. So, and that's what kind of makes it a bit more annoying because he actually says it's, you know, you know, it's in my opinion that it's like this, but then he contradicts himself with another opinion that he specifically says is his opinion. So it's, it goes a step further from just defending the game to he's actually saying that it's his opinion, 
But his opinion, I mean, where's the credibility in that opinion if it's, you know, it's doing a 180 every few months? What's the last time you saw Bastiak share his opinion arguing against a feature in Diablo 3? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I don't believe that's ever happened. I, I so, think he I should mean, just, just keep his opinion. Like, he should just not say it's my opinion because he's, he, everyone's go, he's, he's going to contradict himself. It's just a matter of time. Maybe that's his tell. Like, you know, in, in poker, like when someone's <laughs> bluffing, you know, they, they look at their hands or something. Yeah. So when, whenever he's opinion. arguing a point that he thinks is complete bullshit, and, but it's just his job, in my honest opinion... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I posted a forum thread and you know asked people to submit their highlights and lowlights, and I read over that last night. And I think probably the most mentioned highlight was the Beyond the Cemetery Gate content, and the most mentioned lowlight was the current skill UI. So we've oh, <laughs> so wow. we certainly hit those. <laughs> My top highlight was the the number of changes and improvements made during the beta. Obviously, they weren't all improvements, as we've mentioned some things, mm-hmm. but. Just I mean, you know, they they initially said you know quick beta test small just just a portion of Act One you know just a, just a tech test yeah stress you know that they said that last September <laughs> you know nine months ago that was the plan and obviously things didn't quite work out that way but it was fun to be involved in the changes and to see you know the whole new attribute system came in and went out and they, you know massive changes to crafting and you know everything it was it was nice to see kind of the process to see it evolving yeah. before our eyes and I think I've never seen such. Uh, I guess, contradictory um, decisions being made in the same game that much to that scope. I mean, they, they completely did 180s on a lot of the game features that they initially were convinced that were the right decision. And that's through no fault of their own. I mean, that's the iterative process. And I, I, I actually am quite impressed that they are willing to completely scrap something they built just because it didn't feel right. So there's a lot of, I have a lot of respect for their ability to do that. So it's by no means an insult of, of any kind. Actually, the the most mentioned low light was the very slow pace of invites and test scaling up. And, you know, min- numerous mentions of Scumbag Blizzard announces a beta test and then sends out, you know, hey, seven more invites today, guys. <laughs> We're holding a competition where one invite per day, and this is after Mr. Pandaria had 450,000 people invited. <laughs> yeah, the first day of the mop beta had like 750,000 invites. I say, hey, we, we've got seven on our Facebook page for the Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I did not understand that at all. Maybe they just planned on going up more quickly, and then once they decided to cancel the 2011 release, they said, let's just go slow. Or Okay, one other low light commonly mentioned. It's two words, chat channels. The funny thing is during the stress test, it was just so, par- like, it was so clear how much enjoyment um, having, you know, when the servers were down, and, and when, when I say servers down, I mean the ability to create games is down because the actual servers never really go down people would go into the chat journals and it was actually quite entertaining. It was quite entertaining to um, talk to other people and you know, everyone's asking these questions and you know, some people are giving them wrong answers, some people are you know, giving right answers. It was just entertaining as a sort of downtime thing and it just kind of showed that uh, when you have, if you've just got a game where you only have gameplay and nothing else, there's no downtime, there's nowhere to just you know, sit and chat, it's not, as, it's not as good and you don't find yourself being able to um, play for as long. You kind of just go in, play your game and, and get out. Whereas when there's chat channels and social features, it's, it's, it's actually quite fun to just get out of a game and, and have a rest for a bit and just have a bit of a chat and, and you know, link some of your awesome items and, and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And you're very fond of the StarCraft chat interface, as, you are, as I remember. And do you, th- do you think it's nice that Diablo 3 is building on some of its, its special ghost town features? <laughs> I'm very disappointed that, they, um, that a game like Diablo 3 didn't get didn't get more effort put into the chat and social system. I mean, a game like StarCraft 2, I, I too think that their chat channels need to be a lot better, but it's it's further more, more, more important for a game like Diablo 3 to have more social because it's an RPG. You know, there's, the games only have up to four people in them, so where else are people going to be able to, you know, show their items and, and talk about, you know, their hardcore characters or talk about strategy, talk about their builds? It's something that I would have liked to have you know, one of the most robust features I think should have been that social platform, should have been one of the main things they focused on. But unfortunately, I mean, they do always say they've got, you know, they have only so much resources, but I would have thought that that would have been very high on that, you know, priority list. Yeah, my impression was that it was a feature, not a bug. I mean, you know, they made the StarCraft two chat channels, and they, they didn't have any chat channels in StarCraft two. It took them six months to add it in, and they were like, we, you won't want them, we have a really good matchmaking system, you don't need chat channels. Mm. So it's just, it just seems like they're ideology of Battle.net is that you shouldn't yeah. really be chatting on it. And yeah. most fans seem to be confused by that. Yeah, and a few weeks later, there's you know five people playing StarCraft 2 now. 
we've criticized the new skill UI, but one of the many one of my highlights certainly was the change that made in the beta, in that it gave us rune words to play with, rune words, what are those rune effects to play <laughs> with? Runes, just go. That'll be runes, that'll so. be the D three X beta. We'll get rune words. The stones are gone now. And so, obviously, it, it's kind of hard to evaluate this system. I, I was sure we'll, we'll go on for 20 minutes without a break about the Diablo 3 skill system when given the chance, which will happen quite shortly. So if you guys want to get a drink or something, that would be a good time. But, <laughs> but it, it's hard to evaluate in the beta because we had the same skills, you know, with very few changes for many months. And then suddenly it's like, hey, we're going to change all these skills around and we're going to put rune effects on them starting at level 6. So even if you didn't like the changes, it was hard not to like the changes in the beta itself just because it gave us so much more variety. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Well, personally, I, I feel the idea of turning the variations on the various skills into mandatory, you know, you get them at X level, is inferior to their original idea of making them itemized. The, I guess the biggest issue I personally have with the current system is that for everyone, uh, the progression is going to be exactly the same. For everybody, you always get you know X rune at level six and <laughs> X rune at level eleven and X and so on and so on. Whereas in the original uh, system with the skill runes, what skill runes you use were very very much an, a factor of what skills you found. And since the runes that you find are going to be different for each person, that means each person is going to sort of uh, settle into a set, find combos and skill runes that work well for them and just sort of develop their own special build. Uh, which would be, you know, very emergent depending on what they randomly received, and we would see a lot more variety than what we have now. The advantages that this system gives with, with taking runes out of the itemization um, pool, there, there are actually a lot of advantages to it, and I guess the most paramount too are um, the fact that the storage nightmare. I mean, again, it, it, when when people argue about this sort of stuff without having played the game. It's, they don't really pick up on the fine details like, okay, so you know, in the real game, what happens if you're sitting there with your 60, you know, or rather 30 skills with you know, five runes each, and you need to go find the right rune? Now, you have to go through your inventory of 120 runes to find the exact one you want just to pick for that spell. Now, things like that, it, one, it's a logistical nightmare. Two, it takes up all your, you know, all your stash space. So there's little things like that that it is going to piss a lot of people off. And in the long term, you're going to feel so encumbered by, you know, every time you want to make a little change to your spec, you have to go through and, you know, maybe the rune you want is already in another spell, and you've got to go now look through all your spells and find the rune. So just logistically, a lot of people don't sort of look at that angle because they haven't played the game, so they don't look at what could have potentially been a problem with it. And that's just the story side. The other side of um, the other big advantage with having them not as items is the fact that the pacing of the game is far more uh, natural and you'll actually get to experience every rune effect before you hit level 60, which will, in essence, put you in a position where you can choose which, which uh, runes you like and which builds. You'll, you'll be in a much better position to pick the right build. You'll, you'll know, how, you know which direction you want to go. Whereas with the rune item system, you might not see a rune effect for, you know, months upon months because you didn't get the right roll when you tried to attune it or you just didn't get a chance to um, try that combination. Because, you know, you've got to remember that when you're leveling up from, you know, in the high levels, when you're spending a good few hours per level, you know, when you level up, you, you might get two new rune effects with this, with this system and that will give you the opportunity to use those runes um, during that level. And that's probably how it's going to play out. You know, as soon as you ding, you see what you've, you've gained you know, you're opening your skill UI and you add those new rune effects to um to your to your skills and you try them out, you know. We're talking a few hours per level, so you've got a lot of time to try everything out. So at the end of the day when you hit level sixty, you've quite literally tried everything. You've tried every combination and then you, you know what you want. Or, or rather you you know more about what you want than, than the randomized rune system where you would have to sit there and experiment and Well, two words, dead zone. Yeah, and that too. Mm. I mean, that, that, was, that was a big problem to me. I mean, after level 30, simply getting a few stat points was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> leveling up would not be satisfying at all, you know, from 30 to 60. And I think a lot of casual players would drop off by then. And it's funny, you, you mentioned it. I, th I think you're definitely correct on the experimentation because, I mean, you, know, you pretty much have to. It's like, hey, there's a new rune effect, and I've got, you know, four, you know, some of the times... Some of the skills, you get a rune effect at 33, and the next rune effect in that skill is at, like, 49. Mm -hmm. So you're probably going to get around to trying it at some point in 16 levels, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. But the other side of the coin is, you know, 
you mentioned that a lot, of, a lot of people wouldn't have experimented and wouldn't have gone to the trouble to sort through all these runes and to carry around all the runes, which I think is true. But well, also- for those of us who would, I was really looking forward to getting to level 30 and trying every single rune effect in the game. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, I would have just sort of a bunch of level 1 runes from, you know, early going. You, you know, there's like gravel at that point. And just, you know, spend half an hour or an hour just sitting in one spot and trying, hey, let's, let's see what this does. Hey, let's, let's see Obsidian yeah. in this skill. But- Did you approve of the removal of gov gold pets, Grug? No. Uh, Azure. I, I thought there were, yes. you know, <laughs> I know the scrolls were, the scrolls were another item that you could pick up, whereas um, under the current situation, uh, you know, D3 has kind of a dearth of item variety. That's part of the reason I'm sad they got rid of charms, for example. Now it's just, it's armor, weapons, and potions. <laughs> and also, I, I found it, the reason for removing them was kind of was kind of funny. They said uh, they too many players were thinking it was mandatory, and also some of the pets were too cute for Diablo. That was going to be my reasoning for saying that. I, I actually don't... I'm actually... I'm a bit neutral, and I don't care if they're in there or not, but I don't care that they've gone. And one of the big reasons was it's a bit of a World of Warcraft thing where a pet's following you like that, like a novelty thing. Diablo... I mean, yeah, like, you know, you might tell me to lighten up or whatever, but I don't like the idea of having this furry rabbit following your, you know, gothic character in hell. I thought the whole point, the biggest issue of it was not the cutesiness or whatever, but it was just that it was really a utility and it became sort of mandatory to use it yeah. in terms of gold. Yeah. You could make you play so much more quickly because it would get all the gold for you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. you wouldn't have to move away to get that barrel that you hit on the side of the screen. And it really favored, like, if you played a wizard or somebody or a demon hunter who had a ranged ability to kill barrels, you could just run in the middle of the screen and, and lay waste every barrel in one second, whereas, mm. you know, a barb or a monk or somebody had to run side to side and mm. they, they didn't even get the gold pet benefit. They were picking it up anyway because the barrels they were breaking, they were right next to them. Okay, another low light, hopefully quickly. Stash dropped from five tabs to three tabs. This is after Jay Wilson saying repeatedly, the stash is so huge you will never believe it. (laughs) (laughs) As you know, things change, so I'm not going to fault him for that. (laughs) They've changed everything else. (laughs) I'd say it's probably due to um, wanting to reduce, you know, the footprint of each of each account on their hard drive space. Most likely, once they realize that they no longer had to store runes and such. Mm or scrolls, or charms, yeah, yeah. or anything, they're like, you know, Why we don't really need this much space. Well, database space is actually quite expensive, and that's what they use, um, and I'm not technical in this at all, but from what I know, having that completely server-side storage for randomized items like that is very, very um, expensive per item. Oh, absolutely. Like, for example, in World of Warcraft, you can just look up an item by um, its ID. Unique modifier, yeah, yeah. Yeah, each copy of the item will be exactly the same. Like, every core stone and every short sword, yeah. etc., will be identical. Whereas Diablo 3, you have, you know, a base item, but you also have to record not only... Each stats, yeah. Not only the stats for each, but what the other stats could have been if there were changed at all. And even if they're legal or not, um, I'm sure each item is going to get checked. And on top of that, a lot of the uh, crafting, like common scraps, for example, is, they, no, they no longer exist. So they've actually reduced the amount of um, smaller items. Okay, so a general question on crafting. Is it overpowered? It was. The fact that if you're <laughs> level 9 and you craft something, if it's a piece of armor, what are the odds it'll be better than any armor you've ever found at that point? 99.99%? It used well, to be 100%. <laughs> well, yes, but that's, that's not much a, a problem with the crafting balance. It's the fact that of a side effect of the beta, because when you, uh, in the beta content, you could very easily gain more resources than you could possibly need and sink that into your artisan training, and suddenly you can buy items at the minimum possible uh, requirement level. But that would be the case in the real game with every character except for your first one forever, so... I just think, well, partially, yes, but I think what we're going to be seeing is that uh, once the game actually is out, we're going to be advancing a little bit, well, much faster than we are, you know, being stagnant in the beta. And therefore, yes, each uh, crafted item will be a boost. However, we've seen that they're kind of expensive now. Like, it takes a few runs to afford, like, a chess piece. It takes eight blue items, mm-hmm. and blue items have only gotten, a, I think they've gotten a little bit rarer. Uh, what do you think, Azur? Again, with the crafting system in, in particular, the the fact that the blue items um, are now sort of the limiting factor in, in your crafting, as well as, and, and just recently, I think it was one of the last few patches, the, the gold price of crafting was very, very high. So you wouldn't be able to just sit there and craft every single slot. And, and on top of that, the actual training 
cost was very, very high. So if you imagine it in, in retail, you're not going to sit there like in beta where we're just farming content and have nothing to do. You're going to be progressing, you know, you're going to be using that gold for other things and you're going to progress into later difficulties where if you don't train your blacksmith, so if you don't spend every dime of gold you've got on your blacksmith, by the time you're level 30, your blacksmith's still going to be, you know, making items that are level 20. So that's going to be quite redundant. So I guess it gives you the option of, you know, do you really want to use more crafted items or do you want to rely on drops? It's all pretty much irrelevant because that only applies to our first playthrough ever, and after that, every game will have a shared stash, will have shared gold, mm. and I think it's just, it's not even worth debating, even though I brought it up, because it'll be, <laughs> it's such a short-term thing in the history of your Diablo 3, in your, in your Diablo yeah. 3 career. Mm. We're obsessing over the level 1 to 10 now because we've all been doing the beta for the last 17 months. Yeah. I think but it's, it doesn't even matter long term. The difficulty of it, which fluctuated wildly, and was incredibly easy early on, and they kept saying, no, no, it's supposed to be this way, it's a tutorial, it's supposed to be easy. And then in some of those Australian interviews, you know, Jay mentioned a couple of times, yeah, it was much too easy, and it took us a long time to realize that even though it was supposed to be easy, it was too easy. It was just too easy, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about that in retrospect? It, it was, in fact, much too easy, and they should have known better, or what? Yeah, they should have known better. I mean, I know that they're trying to, you know, cater to the casual player. I mean, the whole point of Diablo 3, uh, at least, especially early on, you shouldn't worry too much about the difficulty because, you know, the strong, the talented players will be able to push past most of the challenges, whereas if it's too hard for casuals, uh, they have the option of just going back to easier content and just leveling up and getting better items to progress. It's all a question of, you know, where does the, where's the straw that breaks the camel's back where you actually have to stop and, uh, really work at it to progress. Act, act two, apparently. <laughs> it sure wasn't act one. Yeah, look, I think when they noticed that even the the newest of the new players were saying it's too easy, that it actually was too easy. Because again, when you're teaching a player to play a game, no matter what game it is, and no matter how bad the player is, if they're not being challenged at all, it's not a game. Games are supposed to be challenging. And when I say challenging, I use that term quite loosely. I don't mean it has to be hard. I mean it has to have a chance for you to be able to fail in what you're doing and when a game is you cannot fail it's not a game it's just an activity Bashiak who you met at PAX East some weeks ago yes, why did. don't you tell us about that story Grug <laughs> well um, like I said I yes as you said I went to PAX East um, I got there at 6 p.m. meaning that the show floor had actually closed that was that made me very sad however the NVIDIA station where they had a bunch of computers lined up uh, was still open, and they had uh, Bashiok and Krithto were there uh, sort of monitoring the 10 or so computers they had running Diablo 3 beta. And yes, uh, he and I struck up a conversation. We went over a variety of topics. You introduced yourself as Grug, and he knew you from the forums? Well, I knew. I had met him before at the previous, at the previous BlizzCon. I saw him in person. He didn't have the mustache then, but he was still pretty cool. But uh, yeah, he greeted me as an old friend, as it were, and uh, we just started talking. I posted that email you sent me, and some people were like, maybe he's just making this up. Who is this person? <laughs> oh, he's... And, but you actually know Bashiak, and you've met him in the past, I know. Yes. And you um, created emails. And... Yeah, we went over a variety you, of topics. You mentioned three points, just for, to recap for people. You mentioned PPP. He told you basically they just haven't worked on it. And Jay's kind of re- reiterated that in his recent interviews. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that Bashiak said there were not going to be any post-content release patches. I mean, no patch, no content in post-release patches other than the PvP one. Yes, um, he said that um, it's just not that kind of game. They're not going to be supporting it with constant updates like WoW because uh, Diablo Three is a was a you know uh, it's a single box purchase. He did. He also said that um, you know if the real money auction house goes really well, who knows. He told you the beta content is essentially identical to the final game, minus a little bit of story stuff. And that's no, something that it's you exactly he, identical to the final game. Exactly, like word for word in every way, shape, or form. I, t- I sent you the quote in the email. He says it's not helpful to test content that's not being the full game. That is not just me misremembering. That is an exact quote from an email uh, we sent back and forth, uh, doing further discussion afterwards. So you were surprised to hear that because you were kind of the source of an article I wrote months and months ago, last October, I think, about how we thought maybe the beta was different content than the final game because the Skeleton King seemed a little rushed. The Templar quest seemed like it was kind of awkwardly jammed in there. Mm -hmm. There didn't seem to be any real logical progression from Cathedral 4 down to Lyric's bone levels. Like, who built that walkway? 
you know, you're in cathedral form. There's kind of this huge, well lit. You can see like a king and his court kind of parading down these levels, you know. Yep. And it's well lit. It's beautiful. There's benches. There's libraries. And then the main stairway at the end of level four of from the cathedral, you come out of that and you're in this like dirty, green lit bone crypt. It's a tiny little narrow hallway. There's like urns of like corpses and stuff. It's actually everywhere. the same uh, tile set as the defiled crypt, which is you know a few miles away. Uh, in a completely different zone. Yeah, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. But of course, the point of this, it, it didn't seem like if the cathedral was a logical introduction to Leoric, mm -hmm. and we know there's a great deal of Leoric-related content after what we see in the base. Oh yeah, Leoric's Hole, Leoric's Castle, uh, the Halls of Agony, which I remember fondly. Um, you get to see a scene of him, you know, executing his wife, and I'm like, why would they put this after the fight with this guy? Mm. Yeah. And we thought about this, and it seemed logical, and I wrote an article about it that you contributed ideas to, and then it turns out all that's wrong, and we're, in, we're wrong. And so what did, how did that go when Vashiach told you that in, in person? You were like, what? Yeah, I was a little bit, uh, you know, shocked slash disappointed, but, you know, Vashiach has his wiles where you can, you know, I, I can, you can see why he's a community manager. He was very, you know, sort of persuasive, and also I didn't want... He was currently inside the uh, play area. I was on the outside, and I didn't want him to just kind of wander off and by offending him. Love you, Bash, in case you're listening. But yeah, it was a disappointment. I mean, it's, it's perfectly understandable why they might have done that. They wanted to keep things streamlined and straightforward for new players, and also they didn't want to have any spoilers in the beta content. But there's also the fact that, you know, uh, because they're avoiding spoilers, it means there's no... no the beta content is just so boring. There's no interesting uh, story or fights or anything. But then again, also, if they were to actually change the content, you know, between the end of beta and release, that would involve an entire new suite of bugs and flags and story progression that they would have to deal with. Well, what do you think, Azur? Did you, do you think the beta works in this, this story as it is? Did, what did you think of that initial article in theory and yeah. then finding out it was all wrong? I, re I remember I read the article and um, I spoke to you as well. I actually didn't agree that that's how they did it. I actually, oh, now you say that. No, no, I, I told you. Uh, I said I don't think, uh, I really didn't think that they did that because, again, the evidence wasn't strong enough to, um, you know, uh, the article I think mentioned that it, it clearly looks like that you know, this thing's either cut out or missing. Because we all remember that video that was released a long time ago that showed his, his wife being beheaded. Now, logically, you would, and I agree with you, you would almost certainly think that was something that they showed you before you fought him just to sort of get the story going, like see, you know, how this guy sort of um, descended into madness or whatever. So it was it, that part I agreed with. But then the other part, there was just no evidence. Like the waypoints didn't show anything um, strange like that. Uh, the cathedral... Um, I guess, is where Leoric was buried, I think it was, um, as part of the storyline, which mm -hmm. is, you know, where the crypt is. So it's kind of, it, it was kind of natural for him, for the cathedral to be the place you fight him. I mean, I thought it was exactly the same up to, up through Cathedral 4. You know, you hear some legends about Leoric, you find some, you know, you find Lakdanan's journals and stuff. When you exit Cathedral 4, you go down into his, you know, whatever, Leoric's bone chamber or whatever, where yeah. the, you know, the four pillars are. I figured that level and the one afterwards where you fought Leoric had just been moved up from somewhere later yeah. in the bait. Later, you know, like that was two thirds of the way through Act One instead of one third of the way. And so, in the full game, my thinking was, you know, you get, it gets very clear you're going to find out what was at the bottom of the meteor crater yep. as you keep going down. The townspeople talk about that kind of stuff, and we all, I think, we all know what there. You know, we're not saying it for spoilers, but I figured the next thing you would get was you'd, you'd exit Cathedral Four and you'd go down to the bottom of the meteor crater. And instead, you exit Cathedral 4 and you go to some entirely different level with skeletons, yeah. which has nothing to do with the rest of the beta, yeah. nothing to do with the meteor crater. It's like, what? They said that uh, they moved uh, all those things past the Skeleton King to present spoilers in the game as a whole, and uh, obviously to prevent spoilers of the beta content, and it sounds like they just decided to leave it that way for the final release. Makes if you sense. recall BlizzCon 2010, Grug, I think you probably do because you were there, yep. right? You know, we had the Oryx torture chambers, which were kind of red lit, hellish, oh, fiery, yes, those blood were cool. yeah, totally different. And parts. then the next level was the was the jail, which was green lit and spooky and eerie. Well, there was, there was and a, I, um, I thought 
I thought the jail would have led very naturally into the Leoric's mm -hmm. battle scene, which yeah. is the exact same kind of green lighting. Yeah, and especially since it's also where we actually get to see the scene of him beheading his wife. Yeah, yeah that's the last thing you see in the jail level after you kill the warden. And I figured you got on the steps, and now you fight Leoric. That was my my operating theory, and it's been proven incorrect. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm dealing with women here. <laughs> You can have all these theories and plans and strategies, and then in the reality, it's like unravels in two seconds. <laughs> Any other thoughts on meeting Bashiok? Was it exciting? Was uh, it, there were a few other things we discussed. Um, one of them I remember was I was bringing up the whole thing about uh, champion and rare monsters having those blue and uh, yellow glows that make them really stand out, but also make them kind of ugly. My issue was not so much uh, the fact that they glowed so much was because since they were only the one color, we didn't get all the cool, you know, recolors that we got in Diablo 2, for example. And he explained that uh, Blizzard doesn't just do straight-up recolors. They, like, when they do recolors in World of Warcraft, which is his example, he said that they would actually go back and alter the texture. They don't just uh, flip, flip a few sliders and completely change it. The palette swapping you're talking about, the, the infamous in Diablo 1. Yes, that was actually one of the best parts of Diablo 1. I loved uh, how you could find all these different color creatures, and it made them stand out a lot. We also did discuss some stuff about randomization in terms of dungeons. Like, I'm sure you guys have noticed that in the beta content, uh, both the Defiled Crypts and the Cathedral are very blocky. The entire dungeon is arranged on a grid um, which is populated with square chunks of rooms with long yep. hallways connecting them on orthogonally. And it's, it's, it gets to a point where like, you can see the exact same room tiled twice or even three times in a row, and it makes the dungeons, even though they're random, it makes them feel very similar. And I, I brought it up with Vashiok, and he said that... Um, this is one of the things I had to clarify about. <laughs> he says that... Uh, he was kind of uncommittal, but he did say that some of the later dungeons uh, use more advanced randomization uh, algorithms to achieve unique effects. So that was his diplomatic answer. How did he smell? Um, indescribable. Like bacon from heaven. Um, well, it, it was sort of the more con smell with all the nerds. Ba bacon from heaven. It was nice to see him in person, at least, and I got a nice photo with my horrible hair that I noticed afterwards, but... Okay, so, release barely a week away. What are you guys planning for release night? Are you trying to avoid spoilers? Are you going to be watching? We should admit, you're in Australia, Azure, uh -huh. and so you don't get to go until midnight U.S. West Coast time, which is, what, 17 hours it's about behind five, you? It ends up being about 5 p.m. on May 15th. Yeah, so the next day at 5 p.m. So if anybody's feeling left out for having to wait... You're 17 hours into the next day before you get to play. <laughs> yeah, look where and we, Grug, you're on it. the east coast of the U.S., so you have to wait till 3 in the morning to start playing. Mm. Are you going to be up at 3 in the morning, Grug? Um, I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get as rested as possible the day before and then go to my local GameStop for the midnight release. And then uh, I got the collector's edition, so I'm going to spend the next three hours installing the game and also sort of pouring through the art book, the production DVD, and all the extra bonuses <laughs> and what are you planning for the launch, Azur? It's, it's, you're the one person on Earth who has a nice, reasonable time of the day for the launch. Yeah. Well, I think we're doing a, we're doing a live stream, the Ink Gamers live stream, just before, so to sort the of lead up until 5 p.m. my time, which is midnight uh, Pacific time. So it's not be, just before, it's eight hours before. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite a bit before. Uh, so we'll be doing that, um, just talking and, you know, probably talking about a lot of the stuff uh, that we've mentioned here, such as what we're going to do in, in a few hours. Um, but as far as when midnight strikes or 5 p.m. strike, uh, look, I'm just going to... Uh, I've already pre-downed the game, obviously, like everyone else. Uh, going to load it up as quick as possible, jump in, and, and I'm not going to... I'm definitely not going to play any co-op, so I'm going to completely, you know, password-protected game or whatever, private game. And, yeah, I just want to play through the entire thing solo through normal, at least before I actually start opening the doors with, you know, playing with, with friends and things like that. Just to, because, uh, again, with, with co-op, it, it, you want to get sort of the feel of the game alone, so you want to sort of judge how hard it is based on just a solo game rather than, you know, having some either someone who's better than you or someone who's much worse than you sort of throwing out the difficulty by being a liability or being a asset. You decided upon your class yet? 
Uh, I'm still <laughs> every time I play the like the beta. Well, now I can't. But every every time I try a different class, I always change my mind. I've been thinking Demon Hunter for for most of the time. But then I was playing the Barbarian, as I told you, uh, with with a friend, and just the uh, yeah, like the Ruined Effect, Ancient Hammer, and or whatever it's called, um, Hammer of Ancients, and Seismic um, Slam. It, it really made me. Uh, want to play the, the barbarian just for the sheer physics and and the, the power like of the abilities and the coolness of it. So I'm now in two frames of mind. I still actually don't know what class I'm going to choose. I'm doing wizard first. Which doctor? You, you've been okay. Yeah, which just me. <laughs> I really don't know. It's definitely going to be a physical class. So it's either going to be barbarian, monk, or um or demon hunter. It's not going to be a witch doctor or wizard. So you're doing a witch doctor first, Greg? Yes, ironically, because I like the uh, I like the witch doctor's resource system the best. I feel because which is mana. Yes, mana. <laughs> Boring old <laughs> ground <laughs> groundbreaking new system they implemented. For well, him. mainly for you know balance reasons. I mean, like with the demon hunter or with the I mean, wizard is very bursty where you run out really fast and then you're just kind of stuck doing defensive moves or the basic attacks. Uh, the monk, uh, the way the monk's designed is that so much of it is just going to be, you know, combo attack, combo attack, combo attack, combo attack, combo attack. There's no real efficient way to transfer spirit into damage. And the barbarian kind of... Well, that's true in the beta, but hopefully the full game, there'll be a few more options yeah. for that. And with the barbarian, there's also, you know, uh, you got bash, cleave, and uh, frenzy, which are just, you know, the filler attacks, which you use before you can build up to the good stuff. And I'm like, you know, with the Witch Doctor, it's just like, it's all good stuff. I mean, you have to focus a little more itemization and rune selection on recovering mana. But, you know, that's that's just fine. At least I get to be constantly throwing out uh, corpse spiders and uh, fire bats and that kind of thing. Are you planning on avoiding live streams? It goes live in Europe at midnight, which is 12 hours ahead, which is about 8 hours ahead of you. Huh. I guess it's only about 5 hours ahead of you. Are you gonna Are you going to avoid live streams and spoilers? From you know 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. I mean, I'm going to be on the uh, I'm going to be on the forums. So it's going to be pretty hard, and I just realized I'm going to have to that, pick what topic yeah. my late night thread is going to have for that night. You know, it's got to be something exciting. I guess play Diablo 3 would probably be a good topic. <laughs> Original too. No one else will be doing that. Yeah. I'll tell them. So you're not you're not dodging. Zero said he was going to be dodging spoilers. We, I'm going to I'm going to do my best. I mean, you know, part of me wants to stay on top of all the news. Uh, as a member of the community, and part of me just wants to, you know, enjoy the game for what it is. I think the latter is going to be have more influence on my decisions that night. But we should talk about the game guide thing. The most interesting part about it was the the uh, stats, the inferno, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like the yeah, there were four pages of monster stats, which showed their levels and their hit points and their damage on that on all difficulty levels. And it was like, you know, small, medium, large, the size of the universe. Yep. It was sort of the progression as it went along. Oh, yeah. And the Inferno was, you know, 15 times the hit points and 20 times the damage and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that certainly meshes with what they've been telling us about Inferno being a vast increase in difficulty. <laughs> and just even the progression across all the difficulties, I recall a quote from Bashiok saying, you won't be doing two or even three digit damage for very long. In the game. So I guess they just kind of decided to go for a World of Warcraft style inflation where everyone has, you know, seven digit hit point counters by the end of it. <laughs> yep. Okay, guys, I think we've covered every topic to death here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, you've been listening to the Diablo Podcast. This is a service of DiabloInkGamers.com, and we are online at DiabloPodcast.com. Bye. 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 Ooh. Ooh. Release date. <laughs> and we're out. Diablo.